The iPod Nano might just be one of the most disliked iPod models. While groundbreakingly thin even for today's standards, some models were plagued with expanding batteries. Paired with a no-tolerance design, this left customers with what DankPods refers to as the black spot. My cursed 5th gen Nano skipped that stage and went on to explode in my hands a few years ago. The result being the expanded battery pushing out the glass and breaking the LCD in the process. After sitting in my repair pile for almost 3 years, it's finally time to fix it. With the help of iFixit sponsoring this video, you can fix your spicy pillows with 30% off all batteries in the Australian iFixit store for the month of April using the promo code SPICYPILLOW at checkout. They even have a really good article on how to handle expanded batteries if you're doing something like this yourself. Visit ifixit.com slash Jeffries or the link below. As for this iPod, it's time to open it up. To do that, I'll need to begin by heating up the top of the iPod on my heat plate. To be able to fully access the internals, they'll need to be slid out of the body of the device. And that's easier said than done. Starting with my iFixit Jimmy tool, I can wedge my way under the plastic top section and remove it, revealing the mechanism for the hold switch and two screws. After the hold switch bracket is out of the way, I can unfasten the two screws holding the top bracket in place. Attached is the hold switch by a fragile wire that's a millimetre wide. I'll need to repeat this similar procedure on the other end of the device. After more heat and prying, we've revealed another three screws. All of which are covered in a bit of adhesive. After that's removed, the screws can be unfastened. Proceeding, the partially attached front glass can be taken out before we flip over the iPod to dislodge the camera bracket. It's glued in quite well, and even after I blasted it with 200 degrees of hot air, it didn't want to budge. With some prying and some additional scratches applied, it did break free. This is a product that wasn't designed to be opened or repaired. And with its fair share of scratches and dints, I didn't really care if I added more. As I'm aiming for a functional iPod, not one in immaculate condition. Once the tiny camera retaining pin is removed, the dock connector support bracket can come out. This will provide a small amount of space to which we can pry up the click wheel. It's clipped into place, and using a thin pry bar, I can detach the lower section and work the rest of the clips out using a thin plastic pick. Underneath was more metal. As it turns out, I only pulled up half the click wheel. Once I unlaunch the remainder, I'll be able to see the first of this iPod's logic board. After disconnecting the click wheel's flex cable, I can proceed back up to the top where I can begin working on getting the battery loose. It's glued to the back of the housing. By using a thin metal tool, I'm able to cut through the adhesive holding the battery in place. It's finally come time to slide out the internals of this iPod Nano. It's certainly been a gruelling journey to get this far, but everything is going to plan. That was until I began having extreme difficulty removing the internals, as of the added thickness from the expanded battery. It wasn't allowing me to slide the entire assembly out. I thought using some pliers, I could force it out. While it did get it a bit further, it eventually got completely stuck about halfway down. As the intended method to remove the internals wasn't going to work, I had to get creative. I needed another way to make the assembly thinner. I think I just might know what to do. After sliding everything back to how it was, I can start removing the display from the outside. It's glued into a metal frame, so it'll need to be detached from it before I can cut the LCD off. While a destructive process, this screen is already broken. However, it's important to know that if you cut too deep, it'll cut into the battery, which could cause it to combust. With a few slices from a knife, the display can be ripped out of place. Don't worry, I'm a professional. Those are words you wouldn't think from someone doing this, and I don't blame you. But if it gives us enough clearance to get the internals out of the iPod, I say it's worth it. With the screen out, we can see the culprit to all this mess. A spicy pillow, or as it's also known, a bloated battery. After pushing the display's frame back into the housing, I should now be able to slide out the internals without any issue. Well, I spoke too soon. The battery jarred upwards while I was attempting to push it sideways, and that cable got caught on the frame and teared right off. While I did take such extreme care of the whole switch cable, I still managed to snap it in half. On another note, without the screen, I was able to pull the logic board free. And that means we have painfully taken this iPod to pieces, enough to be able to replace its faulty battery. 
I think it's fair to assume this was designed as a throwaway product. I have never came across a device so hard to replace the battery in, and we haven't even actually removed the battery yet. You shouldn't be surprised to hear that it's not connected with a simple connector, it's soldered into place. For our replacement components, I have a new battery, LCD and some adhesive. As I also broke the hold switch cable, I was given a dead donor iPod from a guy named Chris to salvage it from. It arrived as described and looks to have the part we need in an undamaged state. I'll get to removing the broken cable first. After one screw is removed, I can attempt to remove the midframe. However, the battery seems to be stopping it from coming out. So out with the battery it is. Under the microscope, I can begin undoing the three battery connections. I'll start by applying some new solder. This is done to help the heat transfer from the iron onto the solder contacts. I can then begin heating up each contact and slowly lifting up the cable to separate it from the pad. You can also use solder wick to help remove some of the applied solder, although it didn't do much for me. I'm thinking this could be because of my tiny soldering iron tip, which has too small of a surface area, or the 400 degrees my soldering iron is set at isn't really 400 degrees. But I was able to make do, and cutting away the battery can make this process easier and is what I ended up doing. Once the battery connector is removed, I'll do my best to clean up these solder joints. I originally planned to remove the solder and apply some fresh stuff, but that wasn't going to work as the solder wick just wouldn't wick away the solder. So I just neatened everything up and prepped it for the new battery. Before it's soldered into place, I'll install the new hold switch cable. Like the LCD, it's attached using a connector, so it's so much simpler to unplug compared to the battery. What we're left with is a tiny bare logic board. This cable contains the hold switch, microphone, speaker and headphone jack. As the donor iPod is of a different colour, it won't match the all black colourway of my Nano. With the cable free, you'll see it's already attached to another midframe. I'll leave it like this, as I bent my midframe quite badly when I forced out the display earlier on. I could have bent it back into position, but why bother if the new cable already comes with a new midframe? It's finally time to install that battery. Under my microscope, I can begin soldering in the three connections. I did pre-tin the cable to help ease installation. Once the battery's in, it's time for our new LCD. I'll remove the plastic protective film first before I install it into the frame. Once it's slid down into position, I can flip the iPod over and connect it on the other side. Now comes the moment of truth. Did all this painful hard work pay off? Nothing's happening. Don't tell me I killed this iPod. I'm going to try the good old unplug and replug on the display connector. There we go. After attaching a click wheel and force rebooting the iPod, it's alive. With it working, we just have to get it back together. Taking the click wheel off, I can flip the device over and apply a small amount of adhesive to the back of the display to stop the battery from sliding around. I can now take the whole assembly and slide it back into the housing. After all this effort, I'll be doing this very slowly and carefully, making sure that the hold switch cable isn't under any strain or caught against anything, as we don't want a repeat of what happened when we took the internals out. I'll need to attach the new switch to the old bracket. That will involve removing the damaged one and sticking down the new cable. Once that's complete, the top section can be screwed back down. With a flick of the switch, we can verify that it is actually still working, which is great news. Now I can go ahead and clean off the old adhesive from this top bracket before I install the remainder of the hold switch. Proceeding, some new adhesive can be applied to the top before the plastic cover is reinstalled. Next, the spring can be positioned into its groove before the click wheel is plugged in and snapped back into place. 
Around back, the plastic retaining pin for the camera can be pushed in before the lens is reattached. At the bottom, we can reinstall the charging port surround and the three screws securing the remaining components in place. After the bottom piece of plastic is installed, the last thing left is the display glass. It'll need to have new adhesive applied before we can put it back on. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get a replacement sheet of glass. This one has a lot of deep scratches, but as I mentioned earlier, I'm going for functional over good cosmetics, so to me, it doesn't really matter. Removing the plastic protective film, it's almost ready to install. But before doing so, I'll clean off the glass and LCD on the iPod using a microfiber cloth to remove any fingerprints or dust. With that, we can install the outer glass. And we're done. So this is it. What has been a truly painful repair has turned out successful. My iPod Nano is finally once again working. Having now done this, it's not hard to see why nobody wants to repair these. This device is a prime example of why manufacturers should be made to make batteries accessible. Not only does this prolong the use of the device, but if the battery expands, you could remove the unsafe battery and responsibly dispose of it. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, hit that subscribe button and consider checking out the restoration playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any used devices, be sure to check out my online store, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video, and I'll catch you guys next time.